Well, hello, kids. How is everyone doing today on this fine Friday at three edition of our live edition? Man, what a weird, wonky week I've had. I mean, the things I've worked on, anywhere from a popping sound system in an executive sprint van or Mercedes sprint van, the owner's van, to replacing a control panel in a switch, transfer switch for the generator over at the new DC, to running down a couple of issues on this YXZ, just drove me crazy how it didn't seem to be fitting together correctly. And so eventually I had to just go to the very last page and start working my way back to see what the disconnect was. Well, this one particular hose, is the turbo intake. So you've got the turbo sitting here and then you've got the air box sitting up here. Problem was, the air box was about that far away from it. So looking at the drawings, I mean, this didn't really, or the, uh, the photos of it, it didn't match up. So what did I have to do? Buy another one and cut it down myself. <laughs> Sometimes these uh, all-in-one kits leave a little bit to be desired, but hey. <laughs> Probably not their fault, whoever their supplier was, that they were getting that uh, 135 three-inch silicone hose from. Made a mistake, but whatever, life goes on. Well, guys and girls, let's see if we can get a few questions answered for this week, and then I can call it a week and go home. Next week's going to be even weirder. Going to be working on a ox diesel engine, an outboard engine next door. Nobody's been able to figure it out for like the last year, so they're bringing it to me. Here's hoping I live up to the hype. <laughs> All right, as far as hype, let's look and see what I may have missed from uh, last week. Um, Jonathan, I think he sent this in at the very end of the uh, of our, our live feed. Hey, John, hope all is well. I have a 2005 Polaris Sportsman 500 HR, the second one we've had uh, last week. Other one was about the, um, the the display going in and out or something like that. But anyway, he says it's in the shop. Uh oh, and it has no all-wheel drive. He's checked the body ground and checked power to the all-wheel drive switch and still has nothing. Well, a couple of questions for you, Jonathan, or a couple of things you need to look at when the machine is running and you're you're driving around. Is the speedometer working? That's very important because your ECU will not tell or let the all-wheel drive switch um, engage the, the front system unless the vehicle is moving. Kind of strange. Other, it has to know or it must know what gear it's in. If you follow your linkage all the way back to the, uh, the transmission where you're shifting, you'll notice that there is a um, sensor on the side of it. It's actually a gear position sensor because that also will not let you shift if it's in park or neutral. So if those two conditions aren't uh, met, then there's no way it can even uh, attempt to uh, send the signal to engage the, the coils up front. Beyond that, <coughs> if both of those conditions are met, um, then it's time to break out a full tone meter and basically at the front of it where uh, the differential is, you've got a four pin connector and the two outside pins, I believe that's for your, your oh, what is it called? The, the downhill descent. Um, I think it free wheels when uh, you're going downhill. And then the ones, the two in the center, that is your, your 12 volts to activate the, um, the coils inside of the differential itself. So you just need to um, have the right probes. Don't just stick out, you know, just don't strip back the wires and damage the insulation, but go in there and take a peek and see if, uh, if it's indeed getting uh, 12 volts or not. Now, if it is, well, then you've got a, a problem with your coils. And if it, it doesn't, then you can start working your way back and see if you've got a, a wiring issue. Uh, so you've tell me, you're telling me you've got 12 volts up at your, your switch. And I assume that you're looking at the switch where it's sending the, the, uh, the 12 volts down. Is, uh, uh, and you may need to check that wiring. But go down to the differential and see if you're actually getting the switch voltage down there. All right, Matt Tucker is ask, had asked me if wiring up multiple lights to run from one switch, if wiring up multiple lights from one switch, do you have to run them through a relay if using this fuse box or just run, 
why, right or wire them in parallel using the same method as the light bar video on the mule. But whenever you're adding to a, a circuit, whether it be audio or uh, or lights or anything like that, you're going to increase more than likely going to be increasing the load. And every time you do that, unless that uh, that particular circuit is made to handle the or can handle the increased amperage, you're going to need to relay that power from another uh, from us from the source, the battery. So I would uh, not suggest just if you're adding a light bar, just adding it to the switch. It may work for a while, but but eventually it's going to break down those wires and worse yet, you know, could uh, burn your vehicle. Now it's probably just going to blow a fuse, but um, the right way to do it would be to, uh, to add in the relay. Karina Moreno had asked me, I have a 2007 GSXR 600 and I replaced the fuel pump. It worked at first, but after two days, the fuel pump is not priming help. All right. <clears throat> Are we absolutely certain it was the fuel pump then? Because if you just got another one and it worked for a little bit, uh, that kind of leads me back to the fuel pump relay. So. Once again, get out your uh, your at least a test light and see if the uh, the fuel pump's actually getting power or not. If that's the case, then hey, you could have a bad fuel pump. It's not out of the realm of possibilities. I just find it odd that you replace something that you think is defective and then that's defective too. Uh, that usually makes me want to you know scratch my head and go, maybe I'm I'm fixing the uh, the issue but not the problem or maybe disturbed it enough that it worked for a little bit. But anyway, see if you've got voltage coming down off of your uh, fuel pump relay. Priscilla Cooper, we have a tooth that we, okay. We have a 2008 Yamaha YFC R1. We had to do some maintenance on the clutch basket, <laughs> keeping the, oh boy, keeping the clutch cover gasket on the cover while putting on the cover is difficult. Is there any way, any easy way to do that? It is so frustrating. It is frustrating, mainly because if you don't get that arm in the right place, I mean, it, your clutch is not going to actuate as it should. But you're talking more about the the, the gasket not staying in place because I think the cover actually, uh, it kind of tilts out. Well, use gravity as your friend. Um, or if you find a friend just to lean the bike over further, find a way just to lean it on its side at about a 40 degree angle somewhere in that neighborhood, Put the gasket on the uh, the engine the engine case itself, then bring in your cover. That would be my suggestion for you. When I did the uh, that six six three six engine build uh, R six build, um, I basically had the engine in a stand, and I just rotated it <laughs> up. So that worked for me. Hopefully, it will for you. But not having to pull your motor out of the frame, but at least uh, tilt the motorcycle over where you can get to it, or let gravity help you rather. Let's see if we've got a few questions lining up. Oh yeah, we do. All right, Shade and Miranda Larson. Good afternoon, John. Well, good afternoon to you. I think my cohort, Michael, uh, sent in my, my answers to a couple of questions you had. One was on that um, 500 HO, and the other, I think it was that 650 XT, you were looking for a head gasket. I was able to uh, run one down, although it was not an OEM. Um, my suggestion is that you uh, go to a company called Cometic. Uh, they make one for it. And I gave um, Michael that part number and hopefully he got it over to you. Also, hopefully we'll be sending out a, a swag pack because I don't have to ship anymore because we have a person to do that now. Whew. Load off my table. That allows me to work on generators. And isn't that a strange thing? Austin Price. Hey, John, going to look at an 05 YFC 450 tonight. Anything major to look for? Well, several things. Um, we did a video a couple of years ago on um, what to look for when you're going to buy an ATV, and especially a performance one like that. You're going to want to make sure your frame is straight. So bring a tape measure with you, bring a flashlight. If you've got a, um, if you've got a uh, compression tester, Take that with you as well. Sometimes just because it cranks up doesn't mean it's healthy. But at any rate, we did a video of what to look for. Um, uh, if you would go watch that before you head out. And the reason you want a tape measure is to uh, put the unit up on its butt 
and do a cross measurement from one side to another, just any known points in the suspension going all the way down, that's going to give you an indication that the frame is bent or not. And also look at uh, your, your frame welds or, or at the, the different points that could bend. If you see uh, paint that's been chipped off because it's bent, it has been bent, well, there's another telltale sign. But other than that, just uh, look over the machine in general. If you can do a compression, uh, compression test, great. Um, oh, one other thing, do uh, at least open up the, uh, the fill hole for the, uh, the oil and just, just smell it. I mean, see if it smells like it's ever been burned. That's really hard to disguise or almost impossible to disguise. If it went a little too long in between oil changes and ended up cooking the oil, hopefully that is not the case on your machine. Scream in the purple hat. <laughs> Interesting. Um, what should I be cautious of when buying a Yamaha Raptor 700R? A couple of things. Hopefully it has been modified because, I mean, the 700R is a fantastic engine, but if they get strung out a little bit too far, it'll especially stress the engine cases themselves because there's a couple of weak or points in the crankcase that are subject to crack if, uh, if they're not um, supported, if the engine has been modified. Now, if she's stock, just like I just went over the same thing with the uh, with Austin about his uh, 450 that he's going to be looking at. Watch that video. Do a, a a measurement on the frame. Make sure she's not bent. Hopefully, the oil is in uh, the smells in good condition, and you should be good to go. Big CG 75. Hello, John. Hello, sir. How are you doing today? K22 Capo. Hello, John. I have a 2008 GSXR 600. Sometimes it doesn't want to start. It just cranks. What do you recommend? Cam position sensor. I've tried almost everything. That's probably one of the first things I jumped to. And honestly, that it, I think that particular display should be giving you some type of error message if it is uh, the cam position sensor. But um. That would be one of my first first uh, things I would go for, especially something that's inter so intermittent is that the cam position sensor can, sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. I've, I've run into that on several vehicles. So head that direction. Chris R. How's it going, Chris? <laughs> hey, John, diesel mechanic now? Sure, you will, you will figure it out. You will save the catch. Happy Friday. Well, happy Friday to you. Yeah, let's let's hope I can live up to the hype. Uh, it's 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 a big deal. So, who knows? I may take a couple of um, snapshots um, next week. Show you what I show you what I find if they let me. It is a, a navy boat, so they may say no, sir. <laughs> but hey, if you want to see what this actual boat looks like, do a quick internet search on the. Um, that uh, Chinese balloon recovery, the, those two boats that you see them pulling the balloon out on, it's one of those two boats. Kind of cool. <laughs> Big CG75, thinking about buying a 2023 R1. Wow, have never owned a rotor Yamaha before. Thoughts? Look, you know I'm a big Yamaha fan, and that, that R1 is a work of art, and uh, you will not be disappointed at all. And, uh, they just keep taking a great machine and making it better and better. Uh, I've kind of fallen off as far as the latest and greatest, you know, um, model or the different iterations of the R1 model. Because uh, at one time I had to be up to date on everything, but my knowledge only runs up to about 2019, 2020, somewhere in there. But I can only imagine that it's gotten better. Uh, <laughs> seldom, if ever, do they take a step in the wrong direction. Low-end gamer. Hey, John, I, would a 2017 KX450F be a good dual sport bike for on off-road riding, maybe on 55 mile an hour roads and single track? Yes, if you do have a couple of mo modifications, especially if you're going to be in tight woods, the flywheel on that 450 is so light. It's so easy to uh, for it to just choke out. And uh, this, one of the things that helps is having that extra mass that gives you more momentum in the, on the real tight stuff. Back in my youth, <laughs> um, matter of fact, the last true race bike that I had was 1987. 
CR 250R, and that's what I did with it. I went with the narrow handlebars and did a lighting kit on it, which was really just a battery. And, uh, and then also had a, a, a heavier flywheel that made it easier to manage. Really loved doing Enduros with it and uh, what were hair scrambles. That was a lot of fun. But they say with age comes a cage. I'm all right with that. I don't bounce like I used to. <clears throat> Not made out of rubber anymore. Tim Marks, who made the 2004 Recon ES carburetor? I need a part for mine, but I'm not sure who um, manufactured it. Knowing the manufacturer is critical to getting the right part. Can, uh, thank you. Well, you don't have to know the, uh, the manufacturer, but I believe it's Keelan on that one. Um, all you need to do is go to your, your make and model on partzilla.com. And we're going to have an exploded diagram on the carburetor, show you everything that you, uh, well, everything. So take a look and, uh, and that we should be able to guide you to whatever part you're looking for. And if you can't, if you can't find it, then give us a call on customer service. Come walk you through it. Jonathan Melo. Hey, John, do you remember how to fix the intermittent day? The is with the issue with the sportsman. All right. I think. I thought I did answer that one. Hold on. Didn't I open up? Yeah. Um, go back to the beginning of the this video, and uh, and I discussed that at length. I thought I did. Hmm. Must be a delay a little bit. All right. Now my screen's jumped all over the place. Give me a second. CS Motorsports is asking me, installed a steering quickener hmm, on my YXZ, and now my steering turns left when I start the car. Hess told me to adjust the potentiometer. Can you make a video to show us how that's done? Never even heard of such a thing, but heck, why not? I am unafraid. <laughs> so sure, Hank, make a note of that, and uh, let me uh, let me look, in and look into it for CS Motorsports. Chris R says, dang, I added them a small LED pod lights to the high beam, uh, high beam of the headlights. Works good now, but not good. Well, Chris, if it's just a small LED pod, and that's the real trick there, LEDs are going to be super low current, but hopefully it's not pulling more than an amp because let's say it's a 10 amp fuse that the system it was originally designed for. Well, they probably gave you about a 40% cushion in there. So let's say it's only pulling, you know, you know, six amps. I'm just using round numbers. Well, then now you're, if you're only pulling an amp, okay, that takes you to seven. So you got a little bit of wiggle room, but much more than that, you're going to be in trouble. If you get above at 80% load on a circuit or uh, what the amperage rating is, that's getting a little too close, getting a little too close. But hey, if it's just, if it's pulling, no more than 10%. If, you're, if your LED is only adding 10% to whatever load there is, I'd say you're okay. But I wouldn't go much, per, much further than that. Excel Juwan. Gosh, I'm, so, I'm not good at pronouncing these uh, name tags, and I apologize if I'm butchering them. I have a 400EX, and there is something wrong with my rear wheel. On my left rear wheel, I can shake it, and it moves. What could be the issue? Huh. Well, I would think, because it's a solid rear axle on the 400EX, and then you've got the hubs and they're on splines. So more than likely, maybe at some point in its life, that outer nut was loosened or not tightened correctly. And now it's allowed that outer hub to shift back and forth on uh, those splines. And maybe it's worn them down to the point it's, it's getting sloppy. Well, first and foremost, make sure that your axle nuts are, are tight. And I'm not talking about your lug nuts, I'm talking about the actual hub axle nuts. Make sure they're tight. Uh, because it sounds like either A, they're loose, or B, it's, it's wearing, uh, the hub is wearing against the axle itself. All right, Shade and Miranda Lawson. Hi, guys. Uh, yay, looking forward to the swag. Love working with you guys. Well, not a problem. It's, it's, been, it's been fun working with you, and I know the, the team will get you taken care of. All right, Jonathan came back. What do you think about a VTR rebuild as... 
a head plane. Worth it? Can I have a swag pack, please? <laughs> um, I'm not familiar with a VTR rebuild. Which one are you talking about, Jonathan? Give me a little bit more information. And yeah, why not? Guys, get in touch with uh, Jonathan. See if we can set him up with a little swag pack as well. Stefan, hello, V1300, 15W60. This is it good for a Honda? All right. I'm guessing a little bit here. Are you talking about a VTX 1300? And you're asking me if a 15W60 is good for that, uh, for oil for it. Oof. That's, that's thick, isn't it, dude? I mean, that gum. Uh, most of the time, it's 10W30 uh, 10 or 10W40. So 15W60, that, that is going to be some pretty thick stuff. I mean, if you're running in the Sahara Desert, okay. But um, for day-to-day, uh, -day, that sounds a little too thick to me. Plus, I'm kind of guessing uh, as to your, your make and model. You can be that, and I can give you a better answer. But uh, my intuition says that is too thick. All right. Charles Horn, good day. I'm trying to understand how to read part numbers. I have a Gen 5 ZX10, 16 through 20. And I want to know if the flywheel on the crankshaft is interchangeable with the previous third gen flywheel. Okay, uh, we can help you out with this. Chris, go. Oh, you kept going. The first time five numbers on the dash are the same from. 16 to 20 ZX10, but the last four numbers are different. Does this mean they're interchangeable? What does the first number mean versus the last four? Typically, on most of your part numbers, the first set of numbers is like the, the model and then the model grouping and then the sub area that it's on and then the last four. That's usually, well, the section before the last four that that's the most important numbers. I and mean, I'm thinking about Honda or Yamaha numbers. And the last two, that's usually different rev revisions or a color change or something like that. But the best way to find out if it's interchangeable is just go to the Partzilla website, look it up, and then it'll have fi a fitment guide or a fitment list of other models uh, that this that particular part will work on. And that right there is going to tell you if it can be, if it can be interchangeable or not. Okay, hello, Motul V uh, V three hundred. That's an that's an oil fifteen W sixty. It goes for a CRF four fifty. Does it go for a CRF four fifty? I'm familiar with the Motul stuff and great oils, by the way. But that is that is too thick for a four fifty, uh, in my opinion. It, you should be running a little bit thinner than that. Thomas Gentile for a 2009 HD Sportster. I'm going to be out of my depth here, but I'll give it a shot. Looking for adding forward controls. I'm told to only purchase HD brands, not aftermarket. Your opinion? I don't think it has to be HD on that. I mean, there's so many aftermarket companies, especially when it comes to the controls and the ergonomics on any and all of the Harley Davidson stuff. I mean, I, I, I don't think it would be a problem going uh, with something from Arlen Ness. I mean, come on, the guy's a legend. And there's, there's probably 50 other companies that are, are as good or better than him. And uh, they, they got that way for a reason. They make a quality product. So that does that mean, uh, if, yeah, HD wants to sell you their stuff, of course. But uh, there's others out there, especially with the Harley Davidson. Uh, now, I wouldn't. I wouldn't pigeonhole myself just to one, uh, just the OEM stuff. And you know, I'm an OEM guy, but Harley Davidson, that's, that's, that's a whole different uh, ball of wax compared to, you know, the Japanese brands. Chris is asking me, no, clever swine. Hmm. John, what do you think about Chinese manufactured bikes? Too soon to tell or improving? They are improving drastically uh, compared to what they were, let's say, 10 or 12 um, uh, years ago. Ones like uh, CF Moto, I mean, that they, they came on with machines that looked the part, but it was like a very, I don't know, low resolution copy <laughs> that you would have on a copy machine back in the 1980s. But they're coming along. Are they there yet? 
I don't think so. Um, mainly because you know the Japanese manufacturer as well as KTM and everybody else, they keep improving too, and they're they're not innovating. Sorry, hopefully they don't put me on a blacklist for this, um, but they're not really innovating. They're just taking somebody else's design, copying it sometimes poorly, and then mass producing it. Now, eventually that's going to be good, but will it ever be as good as the real deal? I don't know. Not so far. Hmm. Oscar Smith, I'm putting the engine back together on a 2002 Yamaha Raptor. Which one? I'm having a difficult time with the pull lever, pull lever shaft. It will not disengage the clutch when I pull the clutch. Okay. Um, doesn't matter which Raptor. I can go ahead and tell you. If you don't have the arm on the right spline when you go to bring the clutch cover in, it's not gonna it's not gonna activate it right. And ask any mechanic. <laughs> That's usually the, the most frustrating thing in the world to do. If you're off even a tooth when you engage, it's not gonna be at the right point. So chances are you just need to do it again and uh, get make sure that that arm is ends up in the correct position when the case is all the way or the cover is mounted all the way down. Paul, hey, how's it going, Paul? Hey, John, I made a video to send you on this 86 Bayou so you can see exactly what the motor is doing. Okay, how can I get it to you? You still do you still have my email information? I believe that I do, Paul, and, or if I don't, Hank does. So I'll just uh, I'll shoot it to you, or Hank, if you would um, shoot it to Paul so he can relay this video over to me, and I'll take a look at it. Be glad to. Jonathan Honda VTR. VTR 1000, 1997. Okay. How do I send you a video or a picture? Don't really know how. Same way, Jonathan, uh, if you'll get in touch with Hank, he monitors this, uh, this chat as uh, we go through it and he'll, he has, he has his ways of getting information to me. I've been watching way too many, binge watching way too many episodes of the blacklist. <laughs> <clears throat> Is there any way to tell if the old mod has been done on the YFC450 without taking the side carburetor off? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. And I doubt somebody, uh, if you're looking at their machine, is going to let you pull it apart. <laughs> I wouldn't. Bradley Owens. How's it going, Bradley? Um, hey, John, I think my question disappeared somehow. Okay, let's read it. Hey, John, doing a couple transmissions on uh, a few y oh, TRX 450Rs, okay? As you know, third gear was almost always abused gear, always at the track. Have you ever heard of anybody doing a hardened steel gear uh, some type of upgrade? No, not for that particular one. Uh, that particular one. I, I think they did, uh, or they have hardened gears or a, a, uh, alternate gears that you can get for the CRF 450R and the engine is really similar, but it's not exactly the same. Um, but hey, let me poke around and see if I can come up with something for you, Bradley. I don't mind doing that. Well, man, this is timing out perfect. It's 328. I answered all my questions. Oh, there's one more. Um, we'll answer this one and then we'll go on. Charles, Charles just came in. Also, what are the cons of lightening the flywheel? Uh, only, only drag. I can send it over half. I can shave out about half a pound or so. And I can, uh, for buy one for about 1200 bucks. Well, that's the real trick. Um, you're going to lose your drivability by, you know, lightening it up like that. But if you're at the racetrack and you're just doing you know, drags, the lighter, the better, dude. It's going to send more. It's going to, instead of spending that energy or that power to spin that flywheel, it's going to spin your rear wheel. That's what you want, isn't it? All right, guys. I'm going to call it a day in Big G75. Hank will make a note of that question, and I will, I will start off with it at the beginning of next week. How's that? Well, listen, guys, thanks for coming in, sending me some great questions. Makes my last 30 minutes of my Fridays fly by like that. Well, <laughs> y'all all say a prayer for me next week. Hopefully I'll get this, uh, this outboard motor figured out and, uh, uh, what's left of me will be back in this chair 
at three o'clock and we'll do it again. Well, everybody, um, y'all take care and we will see you next Friday at three. Later.